Hello, good evening. This is Saraswat from Niti Ayok. Going to talk to you about the structural reforms and priorities to boost research and development post COVID-19. You know the country, why country, the world as a whole has been today in the grip of this pandemic. Science and technology per se has made a major role in fighting this problem. Let us look at India's uh, scenario of science and technology. What India has done during this period for overcoming the problems which have been created by the, am I live? Which have been created by this pandemic. Look at India's uh, SNT structure. SNT has emerged as one of the major drivers of socio-economic development in our country. Also, it can play a major role in achieving India's development goals. Because we have many strengths as far as SNT is concerned, particularly we have a large demographic dividend. We have strong IT and ITS uh, sector. We have vibrant startup ecosystem. And we are a very fast growing economy. We have an increasing demand for scientific inputs to solve various problems in the socio-economic, the industrial and the strategic domains. In order to elevate its global prominence, it is crucial for India to convert those underlying challenges into opportunities. Let's also look at what India achieved during this period through the science and technology during the COVID-19 scenario. The major contributions of our scientists this, during this period from various organizations like CSIR, DRDO, ICMR, Sri Chitra Institute of Technology and Medical Science, IITs, Pharma Industries, Department of Biotechnologies, Biorec, Department of Science and Technology, large number of industries and large number of other academic institutions have made tremendous contribution. What they have done is they have helped us to do epidemiological studies and simulation of the spread of coronavirus under different conditions and scenarios. We have got a national program on development of vaccine, which is likely to come in the uh, testing for which force multiplication has been done by utilizing the facilities at number of places. We have also done what is called new methods for testing based on the gene concept or rapid test kits based on antibodies. There are a large number of companies which are today working on finding diagnostics methods using either X-rays or the CT scans in the country. There was an issue of availability of ventilators and we found that industries and academic institutions came in hordes to develop these ventilators. And today I can say that the number is not a critical number as far as our requirements are concerned. Same is the case with the personal protection equipment. We find many industries and, 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 the, and the various institutions have come in this force. We also have software platforms for accounting of COVID-19, you know, the Aroga Setu and the issues which are uh, alarming to the communities that have been done. These are some of the major contributions which have been made other than, of course, our health workers, our police forces and others who have done tremendous work in ensuring that the requirements of the public as a whole are met. But what we have done while doing so, we found a number of problems and I would like to highlight some of them so that we'll take lessons from them and then go ahead when we go post-COVID. One of the major things which we found was delay in setting up test centers and lack of inventory of the test kits at that time. By and large, our industry was deficient due to our dependence of, on import from foreign countries and particularly from China. Indian institutions had some ready-made solutions, but they were at the proof of concept stage or technology level as we call it, technology level three and four. This would require, of course, time and cost to make it to the mass production level 
and this was noted as a serious weakness in our R&D system. The regulatory system to introduce new drugs, vaccines, equipment in the system is not able to re-engineer itself to accelerate the process, to cut down delays. Most of the times, the similarity principle is also not used by the regulatory agencies for clearing the new ideas. This needs revamp and correction. The private companies which came out with solutions, they found it very difficult in getting their products accepted by the government agency because of the labyrinthic process of the regulations which are actually uh, to follow the step-by-step -step process, which is okay for a peacetime operation. But when you are in a situation like this pandemic, I think we need to really re-engineer our processes. Hence, in our system post-COVID, certain modifications are required for meeting these uh, uh, situations. I would like to now highlight what will be the impact, economic impact of this post, uh, if of this uh, COVID on various sectors. And what is the contribution of these sectors to our GDP and employment? For example, if you take the textiles and apparel sector, it contributes about 2% to our GDP. And employment, it provides to about 45 million people. We have anticipated that its impact is going to be from medium to high in terms of its disadvantage. Auto sector, which contributes about 7 to 8% and employs about 40 million people, will be highly impacted. The aviation and tourism, which contributes about 11% to our GDP, with about 43%, 43 million um, employees, will also have, will be affected adversely. Building and construction, it contributes 10%, and its impact, it will be impacted highly. Retail sector, which is actually the basic backbone for us for meeting our day-to-day -day requirement, it contributes about 10%. And the 10% of the total Indian workforce is also employed there. So it will have a medium to high impact as far as COVID is concerned by 2021. Education and skilling, it contributes only 3%. So it will have a medium impact. Financial sector contributes 9%. It will also have a medium impact. Food and agriculture is major, which contributes about 15%. 10% of the total Indian workforce is employed there. will also have a medium impact. And the worst will be the MSMEs who have been now shut down. They contribute 30% to our GDP and employ of almost 114 million people will be highly impacted. Now, in this scenario, our economy will get certainly uh, affected. So what should be done to revamp the economy in such an, what are the imperatives available? What are the technology options available to, for us to go ahead? For that, recovery of the Indian economy will depend upon adoption of appropriate measures, policy support, and unconventional strategies. What are those? Those are basically for detailed understanding of the sector-wise business imperatives which we have to achieve. We have to estimate the demand and supply position in the new scenario. We should also look at the technology status in various areas, particularly in respect of existing capacities further strengthening and initiatives, both in terms of long-term and short-term, and depth and breadth of the foreign partnerships, what kind of things we are having, in both particularly in terms of supply chain. And we have to also leverage the international partnerships in, import, uh, in important sectors. For example, partnership in the agriculture sector, uh, maybe with some Israeli companies, MSMEs with the German companies, and large manufacturing tie-ups with US and Japan under the Startup India, etc. The new mantra, which of course has been one of the major mantras in India, but I think it needs a re-emphasis in the post-COVID scenario, will be the self-reliance. And we must have most of our things, at least 60 to 80 percent, we should be able to produce in our own country. Take one sector like machinery and manufacturing sector. We should manufacture critical equipment, machinery, indigenously with multilateral supply chain, eliminating our over dependence on China. Raw material sourcing from non-Chinese sources in areas of renewable energy, like semiconductors, inverters, photovoltaic cells, transformers, IGBTs, control panels, inverters, motors, and so on. We have to develop and produce machinery and equipment for enabling our industry 4.0 growth in the country for which multinational collaborations may be promoted. Take the auto sector, which is going to be maximum affected. We are entering into the BS6. It is essential that 
all the components required for BS6 implementation should be manufactured in the country. We are dependent largely on the components coming from the outside. For electric mobility, utilization of the domestic reserve of the rearers, which should be utilized for manufacturing the permanent magnets and so on. The alternative technologies for battery, other than, of course, lithium ion, which should be certainly produced in numbers in our country, starting from the cell, not just assembly of the uh, batteries in the country, but you should manufacture the cells. And the new chemistries should be tried out in terms of research like sodium ion, aluminum air battery, and sodium sulfur batteries, and so on. The textile sector is one sector which is very important, both for the present as well as for the future. Evolve industry-friendly policies and initiatives towards promoting synthetic textile industry. Strengthen the weaving and the processing segments in a much better manner. Bring an integrated, whole, wholesome approach as far as this sector is concerned. We have to promote development and production of the technical textiles like agrotech, protech, meditech, and mobitech to ensure meeting the global requirement, not just the Indian requirement. We should be a major player. Develop the cost-effective test equipment for, te te uh, for the technical textiles. Design and, avail and availability of local jacquard for designing and production of the eco-friendly dyes should be our priority. Indian electronics manufacturing has been suffering immensely because of our policies in, to some extent and also because of the large uh, you know, manufacturing which is taking place across the globe. Equipment and machinery development, particularly for surface-mounted devices and packaging, should be developed in India. Semiconductor integrated circuits, indigenous efforts for semiconductor like silicon wafer and integrated circuit manufacture is very important. In fact, it's the high time that we set up our own gallium nitride and the silicon foundry using international collaboration and technology on a priority basis with government investment and private participation for equity and operational management. We have to come out with a very, very advanced and realistic policy in this regard to ensure that we have a state-of-the-art foundry to produce the components and devices for our electronic industry. Large multinational players setting up facilities in India may be the most immediate uh, solution. And this to put in place an ecosystem that encourages Indian companies to venture into niche and emerging areas particularly IT equipment, telecom equipment, defense electronics, sensors, consumer electronics, high power electronics, microwave devices, instrumentation and controls, electronics required for the smart cities, infrastructure, and so on. The list is pretty large, and we have to concentrate on all of them. Agro-processing is another major sector which needs attention. We have we should go for reducing agriculture waste by developing, optimizing, and validating advanced food processing and packaging and uh, technologies. Field applications like ohmic heating, non-thermal processing techniques, high capacity, fully automatic color and size uh, sorters, we have to develop. Promote irradiation of perishable foods for prolonged preservation and use of modern, state-of-the-art, high-capacity packaging machines. Introduce biofortification, biofortification and nutrition enhancement of foods and including micronutrients. Agriculture machinery like laser levelers, happy cedar technology, and small equipment like power weeders, tillers, etc., catering to small and marginal farmers to be developed indigenously. Uh, restoration of the degraded soils and optimization of the nutrient use efficiency with the use of new sensor-based technology is part of the precision agriculture which we have to uh, promote in our country. Rapid detection kits for diagnosis of animal diseases and management of uh, zoonotic diseases to check the uh, epidemics we have to develop. Use of satellite imagery for identification pests and disease and management through computer analysis using big data analytics. Promotion of startup on ICT use for supporting agriculture practices and also supply chain management. Now let's look at the R&D sector, which is going to play a major role to promote this kind of economy, which we have just discussed. The major challenges in the Indian research and development ecosystem are, we have certainly been talking about the low expenditure on R&D, about 0.7% of our GDP, which is fairly low compared to the other nations. Suboptimal research infrastructure in many areas. And we have very poor investment from the private sector in R&D, missing linkages between the industry 
and the academia and the national laboratories, which have been our effort to strengthen, but somehow we have not been able to achieve the desire. The major underlying challenges which have been highlighted post-COVID, as I mentioned earlier also, that we are highly dependent uh, nature of Indian industries, import dependent. We are generally mostly import dependent. The presence of stringent regulatory mechanisms for introduction of the novel drugs, vaccines, and equipment. We are just, this is our major problem. Inability of scientific institutions to deliver solutions as the solutions developed do not go beyond the proof of concept. We are not going beyond TRL 3, 4, 5. We have to take it to 6, 7, and 8, that level, so that they are ready to produce. Rigorous approval process for products developed by private enterprises and non-availability of firm orders and line of credit from banks to meet the capital requirement of operations and upgradation of infrastructure. We need to certainly strengthen these aspects. So for this, we need to carry out certain reforms post-COVID. And what are those areas which we should pay our attention to? We have seen in this case that end-to-end -end technology solutions call for strong internal linkages between the Indian science and technology sector and the relevant socio-economic ministries particularly both central and states. So establish the sector-specific task forces in the Niti Aayog for implementation of R&D missions on water, agriculture, health, energy, climate change, and national security. An oversight monitoring committee to be formulated, which should preside over the task forces to provide necessary guidance and oversight. This is one of the suggestions. The, let us take one sector like pharma and medical sector, which has been in the news because of this pandemic. The challenges which this sector has been facing are lack of proper industrial infrastructure, capital and compliance with environmental laws, regulatory stringencies. In fact, there are a large number of people who are not even aware of the regulatory compliance of the student and the quality norms. And uh, we certainly find venture capital missing. So the recommendation is that we have to bring in the cutting edge technologies such like artificial intelligence, big data, IoT, to harness for greater patient access to more accurate diagnostic and treat treatment options. Dedicated program on manufacturing of PPEs in coordination with Ministry of Textile and Health and Family Welfare. Then we need focus on domestic manufacturing of the uh, medical devices. You will be surprised that we are almost 80 to 90 percent dependent on all medical devices to be imported. That's not a good sign in a pandemic like this. So promoting R&D on mission mode in the potential areas such as alternative fabrics, materials, design of PPEs, low-cost test kits, therapeutic drugs, and medical devices. The large corporate houses and the publicly listed companies should come up with funds to support public health initiatives. And we have to fast track the prototyping, testing, validation, and clinical trials of medical devices, such as ventilators, splitters, and so on. This is as far as one sector is concerned. But we have to take some general steps to increase our human resource also. The, we have to do what is called increasing the number of full-time researchers in India. We have researchers, but many of them are not full-time researchers. So we have to double this present strength of the total number of full-time equivalent to R&D personnel. National labs will formulate a postdoctoral program for a period of two years with a competitive salary and employment guarantee. The critical evaluation of internship program should be done. The career progression of researchers, and scientists, and to provide better growth opportunities for researchers and scientists. To facilitate the return of the best in class Indian scientists, researchers working abroad. Actually, uh, Niti Aayog has started a program in collaboration with DST and DBT in this area. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization Institute of Science states that out of, as on 2019, the number of researchers per million population in India is stood at 156, which is considerably low as compared to the US, which is 4,200, China, which is about 1,200, and Canada, which is about 4,300. So to strengthen the research translation, as I mentioned to you, we have to take the technology from TRL 3 to um, six, five, 7 or 6. For that, we have to promote industry partnership right from the conceptualization stage of the technology development process. 
we have to create a comprehensive national technology portal of indigenous technologies which are readily available for commercialization as a result the industries can pick them up and start uh, going into commercialization depending upon the demand create an empowered technology commercialization cell what i call generally a value addition center in each lab in each academic institution with an appropriate budget for upscaling demonstrating commercializing and marketing their product bring conducive regulatory reform such as increasing import duties incentivizing the use of indigenous technologies ensuring a efficient public procurement mechanism and promoting interdisciplinary basic and applied research we have to indigenously develop that word indigenously developed this word should be incentivized with exemption from duties and corresponding products which are imported should be subjected to import duty with a sunset clause of at least 5 years we have to initiate new program to encourage multinational companies to set up r&d centers and production facilities in the country but with a with, with a major override clause that the indigenous content should not be less than 60 to 7% 70% it should not be just assembly and 80% of the items coming from outside ensure a strong partnerships between the academy and the industry to create a culture of r&d driven by industry demand all industries and research establishments must mandatorily publish their technology requirements and research respectively to have a more focused approach to their r&d efforts we have to provide tax benefits for industry to invest in r&d project projects towards india's sustainable goals and projects of national importance we have to start initiatives to facilitate and support bridging of valleys of death present along with the value chain by creating an innovation scale up fund which would be governed by the atal innovation our biggest problem today is we are able to provide funds for initial innovation but the moment you get into valley of death there is nobody to take care of that as a result 80% of the ideas remain in the valley if we have to take those ideas into the uh, into the commercialization stage we have to do a separate funding for the valley of death swimming and that is a major requirement we have a vibrant startup system today in fact i want to tell you as per the startup brings startup ecosystem ranking 2019 india was ranked 17 among the 100 countries based on the strength of its startup ecosystem atal innovation incubation center are also established by niti ayog with the aim to foster 5000 to 6000 innovative startups in india and more than 1500 startups have already been incubated in about 13 aics but still we need to set up a seed fund and give grants to startups as effective initiatives promote startups to grow and become unicorns by policy driven initiatives such as facilitation of procurement of indigenously developed products by the government through the gem portal and preferential market access i am one who certainly would like to talk about the private public private partnership in r&d our regulations on expenditure uh, in the corporate and social responsibility to be revised we should promote that csr funds can be used for promoting r&d both in house as well as supporting r&d in the through extra mural and other kind of research in universities colleges and national laboratories csr should be made to uh, should be utilized we should go for lower interest rates and the loans provided to the company which are engaged in the ppp a significant share of the r&d funding should be devoted to our industry r&d consortia to support productivity enhancing r&d our major problem is scale if we can go for high scale such venture should be certainly supported government should set up r&d parks and allow companies to develop r&d centers labs for which the companies may be incentivized in utility side services and one of the major things which we have to do and it's an opportunity right now because many companies are planning to pull out from china so we should do a complete revamp of our fdi policy and it should be made, made more attractive and proactive to attract foreign companies who are willing to pull out of china and set up base in india it's a great opportunity rather than these companies migrating to vietnam and malaysia and all that i think india is a real good place for them with all kinds of advantages which it can provide 
I would like to touch upon biotechnology sector, which is a major sector in which some major missions have to be taken because biotechnology is becoming one of the major backbone for science today. Initiate a mission, mission program aimed at supporting rapid vaccine development. In fact, this should be done in mission mode, like the missions are done in uh, Department of Space, Department of DRDO, or Department of uh, Atomic Energy. We have to have a similar mission approach for this. Extend tax breaks to cover the R&D expenses of the Indian companies outside India. Fast tracking the approval mechanism for testing and validating bio products. Promote mobility of researchers, scientists between the industry and the academia, vice versa. And for this, merely saying the sentence will not work. We have to bring a legislative action to ensure that in the career progression policy, both in industry and academia, this clause is introduced. Develop Indian standards for certifying the products. Upgrade testing labs to bring them at par with the global standards. A large number of industries are sending their products uh, midway for foreign countries for further testing and so on. I think we have to be wholesome. Continue to work in India-centric epidemic preparedness through the rapid development of vaccines, supporting the development of Indian vaccines in line with the Coalition for Innovation in Epidemic Preparedness Global Initiative. We have to prepare ourselves in the Indian information technology sector also. We have to prepare a roadmap to expand and upscale the infrastructure related to the cybersecurity as well as multi-cloud computing for widespread adoption of work from home policy. We have seen this in two months, but we are still using Zoom. So we have to be careful. Building capabilities for real-time data visualization and data analytics within India. Realizing the vision of broadband for everyone and providing affordable high-speed internet to everyone by 2025 and scaling up the government e-marketplace. Introducing technology-enabled remote healthcare in public and private health centers and hospitals. Building vibrant electronic device manufacturing ecosystem. Attracting foreign investment in Indian entities in terms of both equities and technologies with focus on design and manufacture in India with the eye on global market, not just the domestic market. Of course, e-education, where, uh, where augmented reality and virtual realities on learning platform should be made use of fintech, where e wallet, UPI, beam, cryptocurrencies, virtual currency, all should be now initiated. Agriculture processes, where drones, IoT, precision agriculture would require I, um, in, information technology in a big way. Development of low cost drones and robotics with equipped with GPS cameras and other IoT sensors is a need of the hour. There are no certain areas in which we, give, we have to give focus. And what are the priorities we should provide? As I mentioned earlier, medical devices. We have to give priority in this area in a big way, reduce our import. We have seen this in ventilators, we have seen in dialysis machines, portable x-ray machines, medical waste deposits, and large number. Everything is imported today. We have to do it in in-house. E-commerce and communication, R&D in communication networks. Today, 90% to 80% of our communication equipment is imported. And that has got a cyber security problem. Also, it leaves out a large of foreign exchange. So computer communication networks, computer servers, multiplexers, edge equipment could be our primary focus. Agriculture, I think the time has come for us to improve our uh, productivity by going for genetically modified or genetically edited uh, um, uh, you know, crops. This is an agriculture to answer, ensure utilization of drones, sprayers, micro irrigators, Nano nutrients, nano pesticides, RD on crops like soya bean, maize, and oil seeds to capture the global market, RD in low energy cold storage systems so that we can preserve our food, and technical textiles, which should be our priority, medical grade fabrics for the manufacture of PPEs, materials such as carbon fiber, 100% polyester coated with foam and water repellent, aramid, nylon 16, and so on should be our priority. Lithium ion batteries, that is procurement of the uh, raw materials like lithium, cobalt, nickel in different forms because we don't have such resources in our country. I think we should tie up with foreign countries and set up supply chain. In addition to that, we know that lithium ion is not the last word. New chemistries are emerging like sodium air, sodium ion, sodium sulfur, and many other new chemistries are emerging, flow batteries. All this is going to happen. So it is important for us now to concentrate our R&D in an accelerated mode and go 
one step ahead of the world. Notwithstanding that, still lithium ion will remain. So, lithium ion battery cell manufacturing in large numbers should be set up in our country to meet the immediate e vehicle requirement. Frontier technologies are emerging. We are going to again a follower if we don't take initiatives now in a big way. Artificial intelligence, blockchain, machine learning, artificial um, uh, the, the uh, AI and VR, robotics, quantum computing are uniformly affecting all the segments such as industrial production, education, smart cities, smart governance, healthcare, agriculture. And hence, we need to give highest priority. The cyber physical sanction system development sanction or the quantum computing system sanction with the government has announced, I think needs to be done in a big way. Energy sector is one which requires our focus going away from what we are doing in the renewable energy. We have to look for methanol production plants because methanol is going to be one of the carriers of hydrogen. So it should be an alternate fuel. Fuel cell, hydrogen economy program in which hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, hydrogen transportation and distribution, all of them have to be researched and we have to come out with economically viable solutions. Biotechnology, we have discussed enough, new vaccines, drugs, genetic studies, diagnostic kits, and so on. We are going into an IT era, and cybersecurity is going to be a major problem. From the defense point of view, crypt analysis has been our weakness. So development of cyber offensive defensive workforce that would carry out research in this area should be our priority. We know that post-COVID, we are likely to have some financial crunch as far as the economy is concerned. As a result, it is important for us to look for other alternatives besides carrying forward with our large programs like nuclear reactors and so on. I suggest that small modular nuclear reactors should be our R&D priority in which SMR should be developed up to a capacity of almost about 300 megawatts. We have in the defense a major program for the aircrafts tomorrow like advanced medium combat aircraft. I think that would also require a huge amount of money, but Notwithstanding that, we should fund it to the extent that we should be in a position to support the technology development and building the technology gaps and also build the international collaboration and finally set up the basic infrastructure. To that extent, in a graded and a calibrated manner, investment should be regulated, but the program should be pursued. Electric vehicles, manufacturing of permanent magnets, as I mentioned to you, it should be done and all other devices which go into the electric vehicles, right from the battery and so on, they should be part of our priority. Water is going to be a major problem tomorrow, and hence desalination should be our priority. Water scarcity is going to be another major issue in the years to come. Hence desalination with least energy, renewable energy should be another promising R&D area. This project could be linked to Sagar Mala programs because most of it will be on the coastal basis and hence it should be part of the Sagar Mala system that should be done. Uh, in the recent post-COVID, we realized that we have huge dependence on our active pharmaceutical ingredients on the supply from various countries, particularly China. I, I suggest that the APIs should be manufactured in our country. There was a time when Institutions like IDPL, uh, Hindustan uh, Antibiotics and all, they used to manufacture these APIs, but for economic reasons, I think most of them got closed. I think the time has come for us to revive them with, um, with re-engineered management system to bring in the skill and efficiency. If all these reforms are done, I'm quite certain that India will be able to take advantage of the opportunities which are going to emerge post-COVID because the world is going to see Two things, a new normal of living with all these social distancing, washing hands and things like that, and uh, a new normal of economy because there are going to be new economic order. And the global economy is suffering. As a result, most of the nations will be doing inward looking. Inward looking means they will be meeting their domestic requirements. As, and hence, we have the opportunity to shake hands with those who are our partners in, the, in this uh, time of crisis and establish international relations, get the industries from outside in our country by providing the extra incentives and uh, reinforcing our industrial infrastructure and bringing industry and R&D together as a wholesome unit rather than two different classes to give necessary push to our economy. I think this is what we can do as post-COVID by bringing out these reforms.
Thank you. I have finished. If there are any questions, I would be very happy to answer. Uh, uh, we have about 15, 20 minutes time. So I can take a question from, yeah, one Mr. Arun Pandey has asked the role of technology development board in post-COVID scenario. I think TDB during this, uh, during the, during this um, uh, COVID time also, TDB has played a major role. In fact, they have made a very fast progress in giving the loans to various agencies who were ready to do some quick development and production for this. But TDB can be one source of providing uh, in future uh, much more uh, what is called fiscal support for those companies which are coming with, uh, problem, uh, with proposals for meeting the socioeconomic needs of the country. They should be for translational research, they should support the scaling up, they, should, they will support the commercialization, and TDB could be one sector where the low interest loans will be made available and they will play a major role. That is all I can say. It will certainly be one of the major platforms. There's another uh, question from Bindu Day. Oh, yeah, she was the secretary of TDB. So, congratulations because she left a good legacy. Uh, Academy SNT never gave more than proof of concept of a technology. Yes, that is that has been the unfortunate part. The the our our scientists and engineers, those who are in the academia and some of the laboratories also, their focus has been mostly to generate knowledge, and generating knowledge is good enough the moment you have a proof of concept. Now our purpose is generating developing economy. If the purpose is developing economy, now this knowledge has to be translated. Now this translational research did not find much favor with our um, scientists so far. But our Honorable Prime Minister has made enough pitch on this for the last five to six years. And as a result, there has been a tremendous transformation that has taken place today. And that was visible during this particular COVID time that people are in a position to think in terms of translation. That's how quickly some of the IITs, some of the national laboratories could, con could uh, convert their POCs into technologies and they're already into the market. But yes, this is, has been a, a problem and this is being rectified by various measures with the government has taken. There's another question from uh, Shashi Singh. Post-COVID, mental health will be another issue which will require attention of the government. I fully agree with you. Why post-COVID? Even today, I think people are undergoing uh, serious uh, you know, problems of depression and isolation and so on. We need to really give a focus. But the best thing would be to do that, first of all, mental health as an issue in the, health, in the health spectrum itself has not been given the larger focus. If you see our health spectrum, uh, health, the mental health comes last. I'm not talking of neurological diseases per se, uh, tumor and so on. No, I'm talking of psychological diseases, the psychiatric diseases and things like that, which, which are responsible for depressions, which are responsible for erratic behaviors and so on. Now, in our country, we have never paid much attention to that. And this is going to be a serious problem because people will have to now resolve to a new normal. If they have to go to a new normal, a new style of living, they will go through certain amount of uh, uh, alienation from the, to, uh, on the present style of living. Uh, that will cause harm. And hence, we will have to strengthen our mental health setup. We will have to educate more people. We have to create more human resources who will be able to guide them. We have to bring in yoga and we have to bring in other necessary methods, meditation and things like that as a normal course and promote that to reduce this kind of a problem. There's a question from Ashok Malik. Would you like to suggest five point roadmap for next 30, day, 30 days? Yes. I have not thought so seriously, but certainly I'll make an attempt. I would certainly say that whatever work has been started now to meet the present requirement, because I have interacted with large number of scientific institutions, I have interacted with large number of uh, you know, scientists, I've interested. I've also seen the various papers produced by CSIR, 
uh, various IITs and so on. Many people have claimed, but when I do a scan, I find that it is work in progress. Now this work in progress uh, should not remain work in progress. It should be accelerated. So the work in progress should be accelerated. Uh, that should be our first priority. This is the point number one. As early as possible, we should be in a position to now do this Whatever work is going on, whether it is on the ventilators or it is on the uh, X-ray based diagnostic kit or rapid, rapid test kit or uh, tunneling device for um, uh, desanitization, whatever is going on today, that should be done. Second thing is, I think our priority should be that national vaccine program should be done in a mission mode. That should be second task which should be done. Uh, and this should be monitored at the highest level to make sure that we have the vaccine as early as possible. Because this coronavirus is not going to leave us as we are thinking. We need to do a real um, research to find the vaccine or the drug as early as possible. The Another point which we have to do is how to now go into in the next 30 days because you can't be on an infinite lockdown period. The infinite lockdown period will not be there, so we will have to create a, a, a mechanism for disciplining our population when they are operating on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe a disciplining force will have to be created consisting of a large number of people from disaster management, police personnel, and things like that at various public sites like metros, buses, trains, this, that, and all that. Who will be in a position to enforce, not by danda, but by kind of uh, um, you know education, the, the discipline among the public, so that the economic activity and the uh, and the problem of this pandemic can be solved together. Otherwise, we will go down in the economic scale. That should be so. Some of these points can be done in the next thirty days, and if we can do that, probably we will come out of this problem. Kuldeep. Uh, Kakran, how we are going to infuse SMT for rural development special agriculture? I think it is very important because our rural development and agriculture are interlinked. The best thing for will be that what we call as the field to fork approach. We have to use what is called the field to fork approach if we want to do rural development. That means wherever agriculture is going on, we need to bring in all the necessary agro industries in that area. If you bring those agro industries in that area, whether it is food processing, packaging, food machinery, bio uh, energy, bioenergy based systems, and so on, all of them should be centered around in the rural areas. If they are centered around in the rural area, the rural development will take place. And I'm sure the migration which is taking place, people coming to Terma, what will be the future of Indian Ayurveda in global market? Why in global market? First of all, we should look at um, our present context. In fact, uh, as soon as the COVID-19 started, I started getting large number of suggestions from my Ayurveda friends from various industries. Like, for example, one BBG biotech from Pune, they came up that they have got a, a drug called Shatpi, which is useful for, uh, uh, which has been found very effective for COVID-19. But to introduce that as a drug, it required certain amount of trials and so on, because it had only the approval from of FDA of Maharashtra. So finally, I could in including in getting in, included by the Ayush Ministry as a, uh, as an immunity booster. But I could not uh, say that it can be treated uh, as a drug. So Ayurveda for immunity boosting, Ayurveda for finding solutions for these things is a, is a major role which is going to play. And if it if it can be linked with the scientific analysis which we, which we are doing today, I think it will become a globally accepted normal so. So Ayurveda can play a major role. In fact, all these uh, devices or uh, drugs, Ayurveda, which are immunity boosting drugs, are being followed today in Europe. For example, Tulsi, Haldi, Ginger, all these things now today, a large number of people have started using in Europe during this uh, COVID period. So Ayurveda will certainly play a role, but we have to promote it through a very structured, structured approach. There is Guru Prasad K. Rao, role of 3D printing and allied technology in post-COVID-19. Yes, if you want the scale up, if you want Industry 4.0 to come, I have already said that Industry 4.0 will come and it has to come post-COVID, it will, has to be accelerated. 
to get the scale of operation, but not at the cost of uh, reducing our employment. So we will have to do what is called scanned, uh, filtered industry 4.0 for improving productivity and quality, but not at the cost of unemployment. And uh, so 3D printing will play a major role because by that you will be able to produce large number of complex uh, uh, geometries, uh, which are taking 10 processes in one process, cost will come down, quality will improve, so it will have a major role to play. Sumit K. Mishra, development of our own communication system is the need of our, what are your views? I have been shouting hoarse as far as uh, this particular segment is concerned, fighting battles with the Department of Telecom, fighting battles with BSNL, MTNL, that why are we not promoting equipment which are being produced in our country? But unfortunately, the major problem which these people are facing are that the specifications which are given by some of our government procurements or even our PSCs or even some of the uh, private service providers are such that it leaves out the in Indian um, manufacturer of the telecom equipment. So we are fighting this battle. We are rationalizing the procurement procedures. That would certainly be the major requirement. Uh, a major gain, but notwithstanding this, this, this initiative from the government side, the industry also has to develop the latest variety of equipment. For example, if the 5G is going to come in the near future, equipment for 5G should be on your production line today. Otherwise, Huawei is going to capture the market and again, we will say that everything is Chinese. So the companies which are in the telecom sector, they have to take step forward bring the economy of scale, bring the quality, and work with the academic institutions to get the new innovations to go into this. If required, go into partnership with the foreign countries, but it should be produced in our country so that we have no problem of cybersecurity. And that is the need of our hour. It should be done. Dolly Basin, how can private innovation center get support from the government? Government is today not distinguishing between private and public as far as innovation is concerned. All the schemes which have been provided today are supporting the innovation uh, uh, centers uh, from all sectors, whether it is Atal Innovation Mission or it is Innovation India, Innovate India, any of these platforms which are there today, they provide funds for innovation everywhere. So I don't think there is any problem as far as getting uh, funds for the private innovation is concerned. If you have any problem, you can contact me. I will be able to help you. Sino for Sinopharm Research Center. Current schemes under Startup India don't finance setting up labs. How do you look at it? It's a catch-22 situation. If you have, if you have technology, if you have some basic minimum uh, technology that yes you have this as a proof of concept and if it is required to be scaled up and for that money is needed government of india provides but if you are having only an idea and that idea is only not having the support from any infrastructure that lab cannot be supported so multiplication by zero is not feasible it's a zero so you could you should be able to get first some basic technology developed in collaboration with an academic institution or any industry. Once you have proven that, then government of India will provide you the help for setting up the, if not full help, at least partially for setting up your um, laboratory. It, it is feasible. Birec has got a scheme in which they provide this kind of arrangement and you can approach them for this. So for setting a lab, but starting a lab from zero and getting 100% money from the government of India may not be feasible. Shubhendu Panda, senior scientist to CSIR CD. How the Indian electronic industry should be supported so that we can come out from dependency on China? I think my talk has significant number of uh, um, suggestions. One of the major things as far as electronics is concerned is uh, basically uh, the, our dependence is on components and devices. Assemblies we can make. And we don't have component industry in the country, particularly the active components. And hence, I suggested that we should uh, set up some of the foundries and so on. 
But notwithstanding that, even if you take a cell phone today, today all the manufacturing in the cell phone is being done in the country, but with a value addition of 15%. Now, that is not a fair thing to do. The total number of ICs and all that which come into the cell phone, maybe about eight, nine ICs, each come at a dollar of two to four, two dollars or three dollars, may not cost more than 20, 30 dollars. But the rest of it also comes from outside. Now that is not fair. So we should start manufacturing as many devices as possible and for which you need to set up in the MSMEs, the complete supply chain for component power supplies, chargers, inverters, IGP, uh, the transformers, even such things are being imported from China today. Now, these used to be once upon a time manufactured in my country. Now, why it has happened? Because the Chinese equipment is cheaper and your equipment is costly. And hence, the one of the major uh, thing which we have done is, which we have requested is, that the import from China for those components which are manufactured in our country should be taxed in such a manner that our product is cost counted. Now, the problem is the scale. The scale at which China is producing today these components is very, very high. And hence, they are able to sell these components at inventory holding cost. As a result, we also have to scale up our production. If you don't scale up our production capabilities, if we don't have international standard in quality, if you don't have your own standards of accepting whatever is coming from outside, if you take garbage, for example, if you when you took the rapid, rapid uh, test kit, we, had, we, we just took, because it is FDA qualified, we had not tested it ourselves. And as a result, we got junk. This is happening in many things which come from China. Poor quality. We are accepting. Now, this all is because we don't have standards. So we have quality standards. We have scale. We have preferential market access for our own goods uh, in the government portals and PSUs and also in the state governments. Okay, private industries can decide whatever they want because they will go by the economy. But at least if it is taken by this, the electronic industry will flourish to a large extent. These are some of the measures which we have to take. But R&D is most important because if you don't have the necessary initiative in building innovatory items, then you will be lagging behind. And nobody wants to take a, 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 an old technology in electronics. Electronics is galloping, so you have to keep pace with technology. Ajit Kumar, we are dependent on countries like China over government, our government focusing on final product manufacturing. Why we should not focus on raw material manufacturing? Yes, in fact, we are uh, into raw material, but some of the raw materials like lithium, cobalt, nickel, we don't have resources, so we have to import uh, or we have to tie up with uh, foreign countries, the mining. And so India is even thinking in terms of acquiring mines abroad. And then so that we can do manufacturing of these critical raw materials in our own country. And uh, the raw materials like steel, copper, zinc, and all these things are anyway being manufactured. But even today, we are in global competition in these areas. So, so wherever we are not globally competitive, we import because cheaper to import. Now, this is a syndrome which is there in electronics, which will be there in materials also. And the answer lies in our restructuring our uh, entire import uh, policy as far as this is concerned. If you if you put uh, certain restrictions on import, then you will be in a position to make use of your uh, indigenous capability for manufacturing materials. Why do we need to import scientific machine from foreign country? Why can't we manufacture? Yes, Mr. Krishna, that is my wish also. But the problem is, how many people in the national laboratories or in the, in the academic institutions or in the industries are designing the machineries themselves in our country? If you take a test equipment, an oscilloscope in a lab, I think ECIL used to manufacture way back oscilloscope. Even they must have stopped manufacturing oscilloscope. So when you have test equipments and machineries all now not being designed and manufactured in the country, even for your research work, you are dependent upon all nanotechnology work you are doing. All the equipment for nanotechnology you are importing, for, for machinery and equipment, test equipment for nanotechnology you are importing. Have you ever thought of manufacturing, designing an atomic force microscope in your country? Have you thought of making a spectrometer in your country? Have you thought of making a, a five axis CNC machine? No. Those companies which were manufacturing once upon a time got closed like HMT. HMT is nowhere. 
mainly because of the onslaught of this foreign companies which are bombarding with the low cost items i think we have to build our own design capability with the latest version of machines then only we will be able to say that we can manufacture but our design capability is limited as a result we are resorting to import rohit verma we being one of the biggest it industry why we lack providing innovative it solutions such as video conference and e education i think number of people have come with we uh, with the with the uh, video conference solution you don't have to zoom uh, use zoom uh, there is a company called z o a r zoar in uh, tamil nadu only thing is they are not free app they are ready to give you the equally good um, video conferencing facility webmix is there nic has also come on. so there are companies but my thinking is not just it solutions what we are having in our country are generally good on some of the software packages and even though software packages are residing or riding over the existing software apps which are there in the country whether it's from google or from amazon we ride over it as an app we are very good in developing apps but that's not enough it requires developing the operating system it requires how many operating systems we have made how many hardware in uh, electronics we have made which is it related hardware how many multiplexers we have done how many servers how many um, transmitters how many receivers when you look at that you find that your it is actually suffering from non availability of hardware and non availability of key software elements as a result your it is lopsided while we are very good we have got large number of our population engaged in that that's why we can say we are a it power but inner strength what we call as the real it is still lacking and hence we had to do something in these areas if we have to really make a difference as far as ai we are blockchain um, machine learning if all this is required to be done our efforts are doing now supercomputers through cdec are in that direction i hope we will succeed in next one or two years we already have come out up to about um, uh, three uh, petaflop systems i think 11 to 12 petaflop will be coming next year so Uh, we are on the right track but i think much more is required to be done over thank you and you have to say something to anybody push you 